Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on the Best of Oklahoma Gardening, we'll be stopping to smell the wildflowers. Over the course of a growing season, Johnston Seed Company in Enid, Oklahoma, let us experience the process of producing wildflower seed. We see how plants are grown, harvested, and then processed in order to gather the seed that we use in our landscapes. Host Casey Hinches also visits with a gardener who has created a native backyard prairie. And on a roadside outside of Stillwater, we look in on how creating monarch habitats can actually save tax dollars. just outside Enid, Oklahoma, and joining me today is John Lamley, who's the research director and production manager for Johnston Seed. And John, you guys sell wildflower seeds, and this is how it starts. Can you tell me about the process of growing wildflower seeds? It really starts with a lot of research in the beginning of determining what will, what's adapted to our climate, what we can be successful growing. Uh, same thing comes to what a homeowner might choose. You don't want to put something out there, plant something, that uh, may not survive. I mean, you, you, you can't get to this point if the plant just isn't well adapted. So we choose things that we can, that'll survive here, uh, survive our winters, survive our summers in some cases. Um, and then we, uh, we basically see if we can, you know, successfully there's demand for those particular products. And uh, then we see if we can successfully produce seed, which over the last 20 some years when we started, we've gotten to this point. We now know a lot of things we can do successfully, and that's what we fo do our focus on. Sometimes I'll add some new ones to see whether I can actually do it, but uh, it's basically time tested, proven. Uh, and of in course, most years, this we can is do one it. of your most popular uh, seeds, the blue bonnet. And we most, know it does well here in yeah. Oklahoma. And most people do not think the Texas blue bonnets will survive in Oklahoma. It's the Texas blue bonnets, mm -hmm. obviously. It's not the Oklahoma blue bonnets. <laughs> But it actually is very winter hardy. Um, about four years ago, three or four years ago, um, we got down to minus six, no snow cover. Mm -hmm. And they survived beautifully. A lot of the canola and the wheat took a pretty good hit. But amazingly enough, the blue bonnet survived quite well and had a really good crop. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's one that I've, it's, it's obviously pretty to do, but uh, we have good demand. And most of the times we sell it back to Texas when they have a crop, short crop. So little does Texas know that blue bonnet's coming from Oklahoma. <laughs> Actually, they may not admit to it, but they have no problem buying them if it's short. So yeah. what are some of the other wildflowers you have growing uh, around here? We also do uh, the uh, Lanceleaf coreopsis, a little more commonly known as tick seed. Uh, we do some pitcher sage, a small amount, uh, partridge pea, uh, Illinois bundle flower, the Maximine sunflower, purple prey clover, uh, a few of them probably escape me. Um, lead plant. Most of those we, we initially started more to focus on the prey restoration. Uh, obviously blue bonnets are a little more of a showy typical wildflower that you think of. But in recent years with the, with the pollinator, pollinator uh, issue come out with the bees, uh, we've started focusing a little bit more on gearing up towards that as well as the monarch, bar monarch butterflies. Some of those species are required for that we don't do well but we can offset that in our mix by growing some of these we do, and then we can always purchase those and put the blends together. Okay. So it gives us a little bit of an edge because we're growing things that maybe somebody else wants but can't do, yet we can get those so we can we can work together with those companies to, so everybody is a win-win situation to provide what needs to be out there to the consumer. And of course, you can't forget that grasses are a valuable component. So what are exactly. some of the grasses that you guys are growing? We, uh, probably the, one of the biggest ones, of course, is we, 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 we produce seeded Bermuda grasses. Uh, with the original with Gaiman, Bermuda grass was a forage type. Uh, then of course we moved into Wrangler, which is still popular. It was uh, we did, it was developed uh, almost 20 years ago and still is 
great demand for it as a forage grass. And Riviera Bermuda grass, which was developed also by Oklahoma State, um, is one that we've been growing for almost 20 years now that is uh, successful around the world. And we've recently uh, developed some of our own. We'll have a new one out this, this spring called Monaco. Uh, that is a very similar to Riviera, but better seed production, uh, which should make it eventually more affordable to the consumer. And now getting back to the wildflowers, I mean, a lot of times we don't think of them as a crop, but that's exactly how mm -hmm. you guys treat them here. We, yep. So we, you planted them in the fall? These, the blue bonnets were, um, for a homeowner, uh, you know, you, purchase, you would purchase the seed. Um, they are a little bit of a challenge to get to germinate. Uh, they don't, the seed has to soak up, be penetrated by the water, and they have a hard seed coat. So in the first year, you may see, you know, 10 to 15% germination from your blue bonnets. As time goes on, those, that seed will break down in the soil through natural weathering and be able to respond and get water into the, into the, into the seed itself to make it germinate the following year. So it's a perpetual thing once you get your blue bonnet started and those produce seed, plus you have seed from the existing year and it's a perpetual thing, you will consistently have blue bonnets germinate over a span of many years. And of course that's a survival technique for it the, the wildflowers right. so that they're not all germinating in one season. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. So now they're blooming. What's uh, and We're in early May here. Mm -hmm. um, it's, has the spring kind of thrown them off any? It or? has. Uh, they're, they're typically a little shorter than normal. Uh, we've had, you know, just, just as the wheat farmers and the canola farmers have experienced the, the late freezes, the blue bonnets uh, have been somewhat affected. They're shorter. Uh, and they get a hard freeze on them, uh, like we've had. They kind of curl up, but they they bounce they bounce back. Some of those early blooms uh, might have got zapped, but uh, as you can see, the there's more come on. Uh, now comes the critical time because these when the when the blooms themselves will start turning into pods that look very similar to what a soybean would, mm -hmm. uh, but they're more stacked in a cluster. Or edamame for the. There you go. I wouldn't eat folk. these. <laughs> the, the seed itself looks, it looks a little like bit like a piece. It looks yeah. like a little gravel. It looks mm -hmm. almost like gravel when you when you get it you know and you get it cleaned up. But uh, we'll basically let it go to pod. Uh, we'll let it dry to a certain extent. Uh, we can't let it go completely like a soybean would and completely dry because they, they have all or most of these wildflowers have a tendency to shatter. Natural me built-in mechanism. So you can come out here when they start shattering you can hear them popping. Oh wow. And especially if you have a heavy dew or a light rain and it turns very hot they'll they'll just start popping. And that's course, not a sound crop, you want to hear. A, it's not a good thing because I've been there many a times but uh, Depending on, you know, the weather at the time, we may straight cut them and deal with some high moisture material, or we may swath them and pick them up, but it's, it just depends on the weather and what's going to work, because the last thing you want to do is get them wet in a windrow, like I said, and when they get wet, and then they're going to really pop in that windrow and you got a problem. So are these at 100% bloom yet? Or you... they've, they've got a little ways to go. Okay. Uh, there's some that still, like you can see, uh, if you look closely, there's some on top that haven't opened up yet. I would say we're probably at 75 to 80. Okay. Uh, and you know, they typically come out a lighter blue, and they're going to get darker blue, and almost in some cases they almost get a little bit of a purple look to them because they're, they're, so, they're so dark. So in about a month is when you'll be harvesting? Probably pretty close. All there right. again, who's going to guess what the weather's going to do, but hopefully you'll come back and, and uh, We'll show you that process, and we can get them, you know, get them harvested, and then show you how we clean them, uh, and then, you know, and how they're going to end up in, in the consumer's hands to, to be used. Okay, thanks, John, yep. and we'll see you in a month. All right, thank you. <laughs>
pick up those windrows with a combine, uh, just like you would see. So you, you know, like swat canola. them? Yes, we swat them. them. Okay. We swat them, put them in the windrow. Okay. And then we'll come back through with the combine and pick up those windrows after a couple days. And of course, then once we get it in the combine, it's still got a little bit of moisture to it. So we have to bring it in, we have to dry it, which is what we have here on the tube. Uh, and in which air pulls through it and can completes the drying process. As you see many of, like you saw in the field, the, the pods were still somewhat a little bit green, uh -huh. still intact in a lot of cases, plus there was loose seed also like we see here. But as time goes on, they dry, those pods will split open. Most of them will, not all of them, we'll still may have to mechanically knock some open. But as they split open, you'll hear them pop. And of course, as you see here, we have a lot of empty pods now. Yeah. And we'll take this and inside and process it. So we've got a lot of pods mixed with the seeds in right. here, and you've got this tube runs all the way through this pile here mm -hmm. that's pulling the air through it. And uh, just like I said, complete the drying process, but you can see in here, some of them are twisted, which means they're open, they're mm -hmm. empty, they'll easily remove through the cleaning process. Of course, some like this one is still, still a little tough. It was probably a little greener when we harvested, so it doesn't open up as easy. Okay. So we'll mechanically bust those and uh, try and get the seed out. You can see the seed's a little lighter color because it was a little less mature at the time, although it's probably still viable. Okay. So how long will you leave these drying? Uh, it just depends on the weather, uh, some of the humidity in the air, uh, as long as possible until we can, you know, until we can take it inside and clean it. Uh, we like to get the moisture down. You know, 10%, just like, you know, 10, 12%, just like a farmer would with wheat or something like okay. that. Get the moisture, that way, once we get it processed, put in the bag, it won't spoil. We, we can't have any moisture because then your germination will be affecting germination and bad things And that leads to mold and mildew That's within exactly your seeds, right. right. It, should, it stores best at the lowest possible moisture. Okay. And so that's what we're shooting for. So once it's dried, then what's the next step? We gotta we'll, get them uh, some of these holes We'll take out the of skid it. loader, stick the skid loader, pick it up, put it in a truck or a grain cart, haul it over, put it into the cleaning facility, and uh, we'll process it through a series of screens, and uh, which will remove those empty pods with the, probably most likely the empty ones, from the, the holes, I'd say, through the air. The full pods will still scalp over the top and we'll reprocess those. And as eventually everything goes into just a small loose seed uh, with air, set of screens, we'll clean it to probably 99% plus purity. And when you say the air, the air actually is shooting There's actually some of the stuff? Actually, it's pulling air. It's like a, like a vacuum on it. Okay. So all the lighter stuff material will be sucked off okay. as it flows through the system. Okay. And then there's, you know, if there's any issues with weed, there's, there's additional equipment or machines that we may require to get out some problem issues. But based on what I saw in the field and the crop, I think we're fine. Well, once we go through the screen process, we should be good to go. So we'll after you've screened your seed, is that ready to be packaged or what? Actually, it, it will, what we'll do is we'll, we'll do initial testing on it. We'll send it off to a lab. Uh, they will do check the purity and the, germ the germination on it. Mm -hmm. And if that's all satisfactory, then uh, we will take that, that seed and then of course package it as we're, you know, whatever the end consumer is gonna buy it in, whether it's a 50 pound bag or a two pound bag or a four pound, just depends on what the end consumer, what their, uh, what the demand is. Okay, so you can kind of custom Yes, we kind of custom that. do it. And we're, most of this, most of the blue bonds typically will go into the wholesale market, basically to Texas. Okay. Uh, if, if, you know, if the crop's short down there, or we might even carry over some seed, just depends on what the demand is this year. And we've seen in this process a lot of other wildflowers that you're mm -hmm. growing here also, um, some of the lead plant and purple prairie mm -hmm. clover. Is the process similar for those? It or? is very similar. Uh, we, we, once again, once it, once it gets close to maturity, not mm -hmm. completely mature, because like I said, they tend to see to shatter. So we, you sneak up on them, you try to kind of harvest them a little bit of green and lay them down, put them in the Because that's the worst thing is if they start shattering. If they start the shattering, you, you basically lost, you lost it. Yeah. I mean, if they, you, want, you want a little bit, because, because being a wild species, they don't all mature evenly. Mm -hmm. So it prevents you from like direct combining in a lot of cases. Okay. And that's why we try to put it in the wind row to let it dry. But some of it's gonna be, you'll still see maybe a few blooms in the field when you're, hard, when you're swathing it, mm -hmm. versus you'll see some of the shatter. So you gotta pick that fine line in there where you maximize your yield. Uh, hope the weather doesn't get you like it did on some of the blue bonnets. And uh, then we'll go ahead and combine it, pick it up, bring it in finish drying it, and then we'll run through the process just like this. Okay, and of course, you have wildflowers that are gonna continue blooming throughout all into the fall, mm -hmm. right? So you'll be doing this process over and over. It's, it's, 
kind of a continual because, which is a nice thing for like the pollinator species. Mm -hmm. You don't want them all blooming at once. So we, we started with the blue bonnets in this case and I'll probably finish up with the Maxwell and sunflower. And there's oxide daisy, there's the purple prairie clover, the lead plant, the uh, Illinois bundle flower, the partridge pea, uh, some others <laughs> I've probably left out that'll continually go. So that's why when you do a pollinator, they do a pollinator mix, not just a pollinator species. Right. That way there's a constant blooming throughout the season to, you know, for the monarchs as well as like the pollinator species, there's constant food source all the way through the season. Excellent. Well, John, this has been fantastic. And sure. thank you for sharing the story before the seed gets into the sure. package. You're more than welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. Yep. the home of Tom and Nancy Stevens outside of Stillwater, Oklahoma. And Nancy, you're a homeowner that you've got a little bit of a land here and you've decided to quit mowing your front yard. Can you tell us what made you choose that? That's right. We moved here nine years ago and we used to mow all of this. And um, I don't know, a few years ago, um, um, I was out mowing and I started noticing interesting plants so I'd mow around them uh -huh. and uh, and and then I found out what they were and I liked it <laughs> and so <laughs> every year I mowed I would uh, just leave interesting plants or that I um, finally just quit mowing all together. Right, and, and so now you have like milkweed and we're finding plantains and... Exactly. It must just be a joy to come out here and see kind of what's new and discover those things. Every, every day I try to take a walk through here and I'm just amazed at, uh, it's just forever changing. There's uh -huh. always something new blooming or uh, something I find that I don't, I have to try to identify. And it's just, it's just a, I've just loved it. So instead of you know having to be a chore, you exactly. have to mow it every couple of days, spin that gasoline and that sort of stuff. Now you just take a walk through it and you get to see things like the Indian paintbrush, mm -hmm. um, you know, the goat's beard, which is this neat little daisy-like flower. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you found one that was really unique last year. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> right, and um, I don't know how many times I had walked by this little plant. But uh, I was out walking with the dog and uh, looked down and there was this little, little plant about this tall and it had spiral white flowers around the top, no leaves. And I, I, uh, I identified it and got some confirmation that it was a, um, a native orchid, wow. a terrestrial orchid that, that lives here. I had no idea we had orchids in the United States. Yeah, and right out here in your front yard <laughs> right. in the prairie. It not wasn't what, in a greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> not what you think of as an orchid. Exactly. But, but a nice little surprise. Yes. Well, and you've got more across the way. Let's go take a look over there. Okay. So Nancy, just coming across the street, it's amazing how you see different plants over here. It, yes. You've got the Mexican hat that's starting to come on. And you only have one Indian paintbrush over exactly. here. Exactly. It's here somewhere, but hopefully next year we'll have more. Yeah. And you've got some uh, Rubeckia coming. Mm -hmm. So who ha have you used as a resource to help you identify some of these plants? Well, I have a few books, but um, I'm not trained as a, uh, you know, bi botanist at all. And so uh, I found a group on Facebook uh, run by the uh, Oklahoma Native Plant Society and I joined that group and I have really learned a lot. I mean I you take a picture of something and post it on their page and you get um, uh, you know several people that can comment and uh, at least give you some ideas of what it is, but most of the time their idea is correct. Oh well, good, kind and, of leads uh, you down through your research a little right. bit. Right. And so, do you mow this, or what are you going to do with it eventually throughout the season? How do well, you maintain after, it? After our Mexican hats and the uh, Rudbeckia bloom, I will, um, this, this grass, uh, annual grass will grow, you know, will die, and it'll, everything will start looking ratty. So probably mid-summer, uh, 
August sometime. I will mow, I'll mow all this down and except for the grasses. And if you look out through here, you can see uh, clumps of grass, blue stem, uh -huh. and there's some, um, oh, I don't know, several different kinds of grasses out here. So you'll let those come And out. I'll let those grow up. And then in the fall, you know, they'll be standing up out here putting on a show and and uh, then we'll have something to look at all winter. Well, mowing it just a couple of times during the season sure beats right. you know, mowing it every week or a exactly. couple of weeks. Exactly, it saves a lot of mower gas. And just look at all the flowers that you get when you really get out here in the garden. That's right. Well, Nancy, you have a lovely prairie garden out here and thank you for sharing it with us. Well, you're welcome, thank you for coming. Highway 51 just west of Stillwater and joining us today is Dr. Dennis Martin with Turf Grass and Dr. Martin you've been working with ODOT for a few years several years actually yes. about mowing treatments and what the, what are we looking at right now? We're on a uh, roadside that is uh, looking at the effect of uh, mowing regimes on uh, prevalence of milkweed and also some of the plants that help pollinators do their thing. So you've been doing this particular experiment for about three years, is that correct? That's correct. It's a cooperative project between the Oklahoma Department of Transportation and Oklahoma State University. The departments involved are horticulture and landscape architecture and also integrative biology. And we've talked with you once before. Just give us a little bit of a recap of what the experiment is that you've, you're doing here. As Great. far as the mowing. Well, we're focusing on areas outside the clear safety zone. The clear safety zone, for instance, is the first 30 feet approximately from the edge of the paved shoulder out into the ditch. There's a lot of uh, area outside of that, which there's flexibility in how it's managed for the benefit of pollinators, including the monarch butterfly. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of the research is to look at different mowing timings. The clear safety zone might be mowed three to five times a year, depending on whether it's an urban zone or a rural area. But the area outside the clear and safety zone, there's some opportunity to save taxpayer dollars and also accommodate pollinators, including the monarch butterfly. Because we're outside the safety zone, that's we always correct. want to make sure that's safe for people that might be having car trouble or whatever. But Absolutely. We want, uh, ODOT wants them to be able to see for as far as possible to react to a stopped vehicle or a deer that wants to cross the road, those types of things. So we're not talking about programs that affect clear safety zone, but the area outside of that. Yeah, there's a lot more land area that ODOT has to manage. Absolutely. Um, so this research is kind of looking at different mowing patterns. Um, you've got several plots and you're doing six treatments to the different plots? That's correct. Originally there were uh, five mowing treatments that Dr. Kristen Ball and myself were examining. Uh, those included a non-mowed treatment, uh, mowing around the major holidays of Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and uh, Labor Day, and then a post uh, season cleanup and that was to accommodate uh, lots of visibility and traffic on the roadside so be able to see for long distances but of course these are outside clear safety zones so there's lots of flexibility opportunity to save on mowing so some of the other treatments included uh, a mid-july mowing and then a mid-july plus post freeze and then a uh, after freeze uh, cleanup only. So there were five original treatments with some of the information that we've learned and what ODOT has actually integrated in the last couple years. We've added another treatment where uh, we'll be mowing uh, in mid-June and then post-frost and the idea there is it allows the monarchs to come through and also pollinators to use most of the forbs or broadleaves out there but also before the Johnson grass clumps are allowed to flower, uh, it, it cuts them down so they don't generate as much seed. They so. can get aggressive a little bit on you. Absolutely. We wish our roadsides were completely free of Johnson grass, but they're not. So. And, and behind us, you can see one of the treatments that you've already done. This was the first Memorial Day uh, treatment. Yes, that was our uh, uh, plan to mow that uh, four times a year at the major holidays, the three major holidays and post uh, freeze cleanup. So it's been mowed and it's the area that's been mowed and no flags in it. Dr. Baum's portion of the team has already flagged the milkweeds that are out here so that you can see at every flag site, there's actually a milkweed. Okay, and so pretty soon you'll be doing that mid-June mowing as well, is that correct? That's correct. Um, that is another treatment that's been added. And then Dr. 
uh, Kristen Baum's portion of the team, the surveyors will come back and she'll see whether some of those milkweeds are regenerating at different times during the year, as well as checking for the presence of, of monarch eggs and larvae uh, at the different sites. All right, well, thank you for sharing the mowing treatments with us, Dr. Martin. Happy to do so. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week on Oklahoma Gardening, we'll be back with new shows for another growing season. It's going to be a great year to be back out in the garden, planting, tending, and watching things grow. Can you dig it? It's time for some brand new TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.